and welcome to Startup Street. I'm Shruti Mishra and with me are Arundhati Ramanan and from the Bangalore studio we have Ritu Singh. These are the top headlines from the startup space. RBI to launch the first pilot of retail digital rupee from the 1st of December, starting with closed user groups of customers and merchants across Mumbai, <coughs> Delhi, Bengaluru and Bhuvaneshwar. Verse Innovation, the parent company of Daily Hunt and Josh, lays off 150 employees of 5% of its 3,000 strong workforce, also announces pay cups for employees earning more than 10 lakh per annum. Chat based hiring platform Hirex lays off 200 employees or 40% of its workforce, calling it organizational restructuring with a strategic change in the business model, as per reports. Cred to acquire lending as a service platform Credit Vidya in a cash and stock deal. After the acquisition, which is Cred's third, the two companies will continue to operate independently. The collapse of crypto exchange FTX continues to send ripples across the industry. Crypto lender block fee, which was valued at $5 billion, recently files for bankruptcy. Another smaller crypto exchange called Bitfront plans to shut down. Elon Musk feuds with Apple, accuses the tech giant of trying to censor the platform by pausing advertising, also claims that Apple threatened to pull Twitter from its app store. Chinese company Alibaba will sell Zomato shares worth $200 million via block deals tomorrow. The sale will happen at a 5% discount to Zomato's current market price. Alibaba will hold 10% stake in Zomato after the stake sale. Social media giant Snap asks employees to work 80% of the time in office. That's four days a week. The move comes after Uber and the Elon Musk run Twitter tells employees that total remote work is no longer allowed. Well, those are the headlines we are tracking for you this evening. The collapse of crypto exchange FTX has continued to send ripples across the industry. Crypto lender BlockFi, which was valued at $5 billion recently, filed for bankruptcy. And another smaller crypto exchange called Bitfront has announced its plans to shut down. The company said they were shutting down in order to continue growing the line, blockchain ecosystem and link token economy. Manisha Gupta is here with the latest. Manisha, take us to the impact that the FTX FTX fallout has created. Oh, well, absolutely. I don't think this is the end of it. This is perhaps the beginning is what the industry really feels. And as you mentioned, uh, we have seen a couple of exchanges go down yet again. You know, what really seems to be happening is that many of these centralized exchanges now do not want to only talk about trade. They want to start looking at the core technology evaluation, Web3, Metaverse. That is what they want to focus on. But the, F the other exchanges which have had their uh, uh, exposure to FTX will continue to see some more pain coming in. That's exactly what we have seen happen in for uh, Bitfox as well. The amount owed to the creditors, this is for FTX, is $3.1 billion. And apart from FTX, there are 130 companies which also have filed for bankruptcy. These are affiliates, these are sister concerns of FTX itself. So it's not just one company, there are so many companies there. And all of these companies have had exposures to so many other hedge funds, pension funds, and investors. And all of that is getting impacted right now. So BlockFi is the latest in the list there, which has suspended withdrawals. That happened in the previous week, by the way. And it now has filed for bankruptcy. It was last valued at $5 billion. And we do understand that after the bankruptcy had been filed, it did have a major uh, tie up with FTX as well. If you look at the company's block sheet, uh, balance sheet right now, the cash on hand is $257 million. But we also understand that there are nearly a lakh creditors who are standing waiting for their monies to be paid out. But remember, all of that withdrawal uh, was stopped in the previous week itself. These are some of the companies that actually have seen suspension of trades, uh, bankruptcy being filed in this year itself. So it clearly has been a crypto winter in true sense and continues to be like that. FTX and BlockFi, of course, is the latest one. But in this year, we have seen bigger names like Voyager, Celsius, Vault, and some of those other names also go down uh, in the markets there. This is the fallout impact that we have had in a larger scheme of things as well. So when you look at the crypto investments outflow, that has been the highest in 12 weeks at around $23 million there. In other news, you also are looking at uh, redemptions in this year that have been to the tune of $200 million, which has been a much on the higher side, a near record highs basically. Bitcoin fund shorts have been created as well. So most people believe that you could be looking at Bitcoin prices falling from here as well. Those positions stand at 9.2 million. 
If you look at uh, AUM holdings, that also are at a two-year lows of around $22.2 billion currently. So the overall structure, the trade, the, num the kind of money that is put in and shorts being created, all of that continues to be on the stronger side. Bitfront, as I said, is another company which has shut operations. They would not be doing any trading. They actually are completely moving out from that to growing into line blockchain and ecosystem and link token economy. So this is what most of the street really seems to be working on right now. Not so much on tokenization, but use case tokens and of course the technology itself. Manisha, thanks very much for joining in with that. And this is news that just came in a short while ago. China's Alibaba Group is set to sell Zomato shares worth $200 million via a block deal come tomorrow. The sale will happen at a 5% discount to Zomato's current market price. Alibaba is likely to hold 10% stake in Zomato after selling 3% via this block deal. That's the one to watch out for Arundhati and this tech company's troubles. They don't seem to end. Absolutely, Ritu. We're going to have to wait and see what happens later on. But moving on, venture capital firm Axel has unveiled the second cohort of 10 path-breaking startups of its Atoms program. Now, the program provides startups with $250,000 in non-dilutive capital. One is to one mentorship by Indian entrepreneurs and business leaders and access to the global Axel community. Now, over two cohorts, Atoms has invested in 23 startups from a diverse group of companies ranging from SaaS, B2B marketplaces, Web3, D2C, hardware, health and wellness. Now, with the help of the Atoms program, these startups have further raised close to $100 million from VCs and investors to aid their growth. To elaborate on the bootcamp, joining us now is Prayank Swaroop, partner at Axel India and my colleague Shruti Mishra. Swarup, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Now, like I said, you launched Atoms in August 2021 to help turbocharge growth for early stage startups. The selected startups undergo about 100 days of training. Can you elaborate on the boot camp? How is it different from everything else that we see? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the show. Um, and, uh, you know, we love to work with startups. So, Axel, just for introductions, is a very early stage uh, fund. Uh, actually, a multi-stage fund, so we invest anywhere from $250,000 all the way to $250 million as first check into companies. And uh, we are investors in companies like Flipkart, Swiggy, Urban Company, Freshworks, uh, Zetwork, um, and the like. Um, so Atoms uh, was an effort from our side to bring about uh, a new kind of program for all startups where we saw that same problems are being repeated and solved by multiple startups again and again. And so we said, can we standardize the curriculum? Can we bring about uh, advice to the startups, which is the best in class? Uh, because we have seen so many companies which we have taken from zero to uh, zero to one, from seed to scale in our programs in the main atoms, uh, main axle fund. And that is the intent. Now, how is it different? Uh, I think the single biggest thing which we are trying to build here is a community of startups. Uh, you know, a VC or any other expert only knows so much about a particular company, but one company can help another company. And by building this cohort-based system, we are essentially making startup founders talk to each other, help each other, uh, and that's what the real value of uh, the program lies okay. uh, in. All right, Priyank, this is Shruti here. Uh, quickly stepping in, uh, you're investing, like we mentioned earlier in the intro, about $2,50,000 in non-dilutive capital along with access to your global community to your 10 different startups via our second cohort. Now, the list includes companies like Brick, DataBrain, Device, to name a few. Take me through what made you invest in these specific companies. What are the kind of solutions or businesses you're betting big on? Uh, very good question, Shruti. So uh, first of all, I think uh, it's a cliche thing, but uh, we invest behind amazing entrepreneurs, right? So uh, we get we get around you know three thousand, four thousand applications for each of these cohorts, and from there, our team of analysts sieve through companies, and finally, we end up meeting around hundred to two hundred companies, from which these uh, ten companies were shortlisted, and these ten uh, companies essentially back are. Founders were amazing. So that's part one. You know, we look at how smart they are. We look at what is the grit, you know, people who have been doing this for years, even though, uh, you know, ups and downs of the lives are thrown at them, they continue to work, um, uh, work at it. I think that's very important for us, number one. Point two is uh, areas which are very good, right? So if you look uh, in this particular cohort, we have startups across consumer, B2B marketplaces, SaaS, developer tools, uh, and uh, by the way, companies from Indonesia as well and Australia, not just from India. So it's really 
we are trying to envision what the future of the of tomorrow is going to look like you know uh, in in a year in two years in three years and these companies uh, will become big in, over the next 10 years so that's what we are trying to find uh, let's take one example uh, maybe yeah. uh, you know dhivise so dhivise is a great example where uh, what they do is you give them a design <laughs> and they could create the mobile app code out of it it saves saves hundreds of hours of time for developers so it sounds like magic but you know that's what they do and that's what made us interested in a company like them and similarly you have other companies all right absolutely so you're betting on these companies looking at them from a 10 year perspective now through your two cohorts you've invested in 23 companies and with the help of the atoms program the startups have raised 100 million dollars from vcs and investors to aid their growth after they join this program so talk to us about the success of the companies from your first cohort what's the kind of growth that you're seeing for these companies yeah if you uh, i'll give you some examples uh, so in the first cohort we had comp two companies uh, riggy as well as uh, jiffy and uh, uh, Riggy has gone on to raise over $20 million uh, since uh, in the last one year. Uh, and Jiffy has raised over $10 million as well. Uh, so take the example of Riggy, which works with a lot of influencers uh, in India and now starting to expand into Indonesia. And what they do is uh, when they started, when we invested in them, uh, they were essentially a paper plan. You know, two founders who basically said, you know, this is what we want to do. We don't know whether it will work, not work, but we want to give it a shot. And we thought the idea was innovative enough uh, that we partnered with them. And a bunch of other funds also partnered with us uh, for that particular idea. And now uh, the company is doing over $100 million of GMV um, uh, in worth of transactions. Hmm. So that just gives you an uh, idea of the scale the company has been able to achieve. Okay. Similarly, if you look at Jiffy, which basically provides uh, early salary loans uh, to uh, to customers, essentially enabling them uh, somebody who want, who's helping them with uh, getting a little bit paycheck earlier, you know, they have also scaled massively with working with large number of corporates uh, across India. Okay. And they were uh, also a paper plan when we invested in. All right. So, okay. Uh, Priyank, you know, let's talk about the sectors you're eyeing. You're eyeing SaaS, B2B marketplaces, Web3, and a whole host of other sectors. Why such a varied list of sectors? Uh, you know, what's exciting you about this? You're sector agnostic, right? Yeah, we are sector agnostic. I think we we are just excited about India. You know, look at India is so multifaceted, multi-industry. It's so exciting to be part of the India growth story, right? Uh, and that's why our uh, like you know we have 20 to 20, 23 unicorns in India and across sectors. You know, we have fintech, B two B, SaaS, and it's just it's just a testament of uh, India growth story. We have a we, our economy is uh, so vibrant. Plus, uh, our entrepreneurs are uh, you know taking the charge in each and every field. You know, uh, you know, when I started off, uh, when I graduated from college, uh, it we nobody thought of doing a startup. You know, everybody wanted to get a job into TCS or Infosys. And now, you know, sometimes my father calls me up and says, why are you in a VC fund? Like, why are you not doing your own startup? You're helping so many startups. So it's truly a vibrant economy and supported by such amazing entrepreneurs. I think that's why we have so many different bets. And India is going to become bigger. So we are going to find more and more new sectors opening up. Uh, I think a very clear trend, if you see in the last few years, has been uh, direct-to-consumer brands. Uh, earlier, we each one of us used to use uh, a HUL or ITC brand, uh, FMCG brands, but now we have a whole host of brands all over the place, right? So uh, I can have a coffee shampoo, I can have orange shampoo, and it's a fact that as we become a richer economy, per capita GDP increases, people are able to express themselves with products they want, and there is a bunch of businesses who are coming online and saying, I can serve that need. I think that is very important. Absolutely, Priyank. Uh, but we're completely out of time on the show. But thank you so much for joining us today. And we wish you all the best going forward. Thank you. Thanks a lot. With that, it's time for us to head into a short break. But more news from the startup world on the other side. Stay tuned. Now, energy transition-focused venture capital company Transition VC recently launched a 400 rupee, uh, crore rupee fund, which is going to include a green shoe option of 200 crore rupees. It plans to invest the seed capital in 40-plus clean tech startups over the course of the next three years, with ticket sizes ranging from 500,000 to a million dollars. Now, it is going to back startups in segments like e-mobility, green hydrogen, energy storage, net zero, and climate tech. Joining me now to talk about the fund's investment plans is 
is Mustafa Wajid, the co-founder and general partner at Transition VC. Mustafa, thanks very much for your time here and for joining us here at CNBC TV 18. Uh, your first ever fund uh, at Transition VC, 400 crore rupees, that is what you've raised, which includes uh, the green shoe option. Have you already identified these clean tech startups where you will be deploying the capital? Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having us on the show. Uh, it's an opportunity to explain what we are up to. Energy transition, as you know, is a very complicated subject. Uh, at the heart of it is decarbonization and energy security. And in India, uh, this is both these are equally important issues. Uh, we have identified several companies because when we say decarbonization, it involves both areas on the production of energy or generation of energy as well as on the decarbonization at the user side of energy. And this would therefore cover renewables, it would cover energy storage, it would cover electric mobility. And when I say electric mobility, uh, we need to also remember that aerial mobility is equally important in going forward uh, with drones, electric taxis, and so on coming up, as well as the green hydrogen movement, as well as the net zero movement which we as our country, our prime minister has already made a commitment that by 2070, we will go net zero. So we will be focusing on these startups which can bring together or blend together the engineering, the hardware, the software, the digitally enabled stuff, all to work seamlessly with one another to deliver defined targets, both on the decarbonization side and thereby strengthen the energy security of India as well. Mustafa, uh, what I asked for is the names of any startups you can share with us. Uh, we know the areas you're going to be looking to invest in, mobility startups, clean tech startups, and you said even in the space. Um, any names that you've already identified? Uh, well, we have made some investments, uh, but some of many of them are still under the kind of evaluation stage. So it will not be proper for me to disclose in a public forum names because they are non-disclosure terms around, around that. But a couple of them I can name, a company Charge Zone, which is one of India's emerging charging network operators. Uh, we have another company called Exponent, which is uh, coming up as a leader in rapid charging, where you can charge an electric vehicle in minutes, rather than, uh, I mean, something like 10, 12 minutes. Uh, we also have a mobility as a service company uh, called Billion E-Mobility, which is looking at the intercity electrification of logistics and freight. So these are some companies that I can name, which where we have already concluded matters. But as you know, our fund is very new, and we are currently evaluating a variety, several dozens of them actually, and we will come to sort of conclusions over them over the next couple of maybe weeks or at, uh, as we go along into the future. So of these 40 plus companies that you've identified and you've named three or four of them for our viewers, um, when do we see these set of investments starting to kick in, say by uh, end of December, uh, maybe the, before the close of the financial year, because you have a three year horizon. But if you could uh, give us a sense of when the first set of investments will be made. Yeah, I'm sure some of them will kick in uh, as early as the first quarter, uh, sorry, the last quarter of this financial year. Uh, but as I said, this is the energy transition is a very, very, sort of, uh, you know, nuanced field. Uh, we have to be very, very vigilant and diligent in the way we deploy uh, the funds in such a way that we deliver the best returns to our investors. So since it's a very complex combination of hardware, engineering, software, and so on and so forth, and typically uh, handling very large sums of energy because we are all talking large numbers of, in terms of joules or kilowatt hours, uh, these are very physical things which have large sizes large right. uh, engineering challenges. So we will progressively do it. These 30 Got or 40 it. companies we are talking about, we will do it over a period of roughly somewhere in the region of 12 to 24 months starting from now. All right, so 12 to 24 months. But, uh, you know, Mustafa, even for Transition VC, you've said about 25% of, uh, of the funds that are raised will be allocated to global startups. There's also some mention of the developed markets, as we understand. What is the thought behind this, uh, you know, between the India market and the global market? Gradually, what kind of a mix are we going to see? Uh, well, the 25% is actually to comply with the regulatory requirement. But from a techno technology perspective, uh, there are many transitions happening, for example, in the power semiconductor area, 
which is basically a lot of material science and and device technology which working which companies in europe and couple of other places are working in we are evaluating them as we speak similarly there is a lot of action happening on wireless power transfer uh, and this is a very interesting field it could also be used to power flight apart from wireless charging vehicles which are moving on the road uh, what you can call as uh, you know dynamic charging so some of these technologies are being developed as we speak by startups outside of india um, there are a couple in india as well but uh, we are openly examining startups uh, right from uh, new zealand on one side to western europe and maybe for some in the us as well so we'll we are very focused on the energy piece so obviously right. we are looking Mustafa, at uh, technologies that uh, fall in that domain okay All right, uh, Mustafa. Uh, we've run out of time, so I'm going to request you to keep your answer very brief uh, for this one. Uh, you know, the finance minister recently also made comments urging uh, startups in India to focus on developing climate-changing farming solutions and not just focus on, uh, you know, the fancier ones like fintech. We do have a lot more clean tech startups in India today than we did a few years ago. Uh, but you know, founders have sort of stayed away from this space more or less. What is the opportunity you see in the clean tech space in India? Very briefly. uh renewables is one very important area net zero is another very important area uh these are two very critical uh, uh focus areas uh you must also appreciate that uh, i mean clean tech was described in a certain sense a few years ago but today for example electric vehicles also are decarbonizing the the uh, environment in in that sense provided we get clean electricity to run those electric vehicles so uh, so clean tech i would see it as a sub vertical within the larger energy transition piece and i think clean electricity clean mobility net zero clean fuels like green hydrogen all this would come under clean tech as well as energy storage all right mustafa thanks very much for your time here uh, and on that note i'm going to toss it back to arundhati arundhati Thanks for that Ritu. Well, in a bid to cut costs, Amazon has trimmed its India operations and plans to stay focused on its core businesses, which include its marketplace operations and its B2B offering. Globally, the company is looking to lay off 10,000 employees across its devices and services team. Shilpa Rani Peta is here with all of those details. Shilpa, what are the reasons behind Amazon's move to cut its India operations? Well, India may be one of Amazon's largest markets, but it doesn't seem to be immune to the impact of the global macroeconomic downturn that it is having on big tech. Now, in just the last week, Amazon India has pulled the plug on three of its businesses as it sharpens its focus on its core businesses, that is, its marketplace operations and the B two B business. Now, Amazon Academy, that was launched in 2021, will be discontinued in a phased manner starting August 2023. Food delivery will also be stopped from December 29, and the company is also also discontinued its wholesale uh, e-commerce website that it had for small neighborhood stores that operated in Bengaluru Mysore and Hubli and not just that we're also given to understand that the company has also put in place a voluntary separation program for its employees at the Amazonian Experience Tech Vertical now this comes at a time where Amazon has confirmed that it is laying off employees globally and in a recent interview founder Jeff Bezos also cautioned consumers to put off buying TVs and refrigerators and hold on to their money since the economy does not look good right now now amazon forayed into india just a decade ago as things stand today amazon has invested over 6.5 billion dollars in the country so far and it runs six different entities in india that clocked a cumulative revenue of over 42000 crore rupees in fy22 now india is one of amazon's biggest markets in terms of gmv2 but it has not been a profitable one losses for fy22 stood at around 6000 crore rupees in india and it face a tough competition from flipkart and misho on the e-commerce front and the regulatory environment hasn't been entirely in its favor either but amazon continues to maintain that it is it is it remains committed in india and it will continue to invest across areas like grocery smartphones fashion and beauty and its b2b offerings as well Well, thank you so much for all those details, Shilpa. But with that, it is a wrap on this edition of Startup Street from Ritu and I. Many thanks for watching. But more news and updates continue on the other side.